Hi there, and welcome to the 40th edition of uh, the Octoprint on Air broadcast, though this time it is not a broadcast, but actually a recording due to um, appointment collisions and all that, but still, welcome. Um, yeah, I'm your host, Gina Hoiske. There's still no B in that name, and I hope by now some of you have a rough idea how to pronounce it. And yeah, it's been a while since we did the last one of these. I have to admit that I actually lost kind of track of the, of the time and uh, one month target turned into two months and, and huge apologies for that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get back on track so that these happen more regularly again. Um, yeah, so uh, what, we will, what we will talk about today is the usual stuff really. First of all, I will give you uh, uh, a rough report on what I've been up to the past two months since the last installment of one of these. Then I'll tell you what the next steps are, then we'll have a quick look at the stats and then we'll have uh, a short Q&A segment because we actually got two questions uh, that were submitted in the backlog and uh, we'll take a look at those. Obviously since this is a recording there will be no live uh, chat this time but um, yeah, uh, if you are backing me on Patreon at the $5 and above level and you have a burning question that you always wanted to ask, I always paste, uh, I always post um, the link to the submission form for the questions before either recording or broadcasting one of these. So that is your chance. Just uh, stay tuned to the Patreon feed in order to get a notification of, the, of that. Okay, so without further ado, what have been up to? Um, so I've been working on, primarily working on two things over the course of the past uh, weeks. One is 170. So um, I already hinted at that in the last one that I would be concentrating on uh, implementing some things that were requested for the next version, the next maintenance release basically of Octoprint and that's what I did. So uh, what we now have is uh, the software update plugin now offers to update uh, if there is a new version of Octoprint during the first run wizard. Um, it also will now keep a lock of updates and I actually want to switch you over to my screen here real fast to show you how this looks. Um, because if you go into the software update here and look into the update lock, so not current versions but update lock tab here, you will now get this update lock which will tell you exactly what kind of updates you have been doing the past month. So this is the cutoff date for the update log and it will also link you the release notes. That was a feature that was requested by uh, people who uh, habitually forget what they have been updating the past couple of weeks and such. So I hope this will help here. And this log will also get, um, let me quickly switch back to me here, sorry, uh, and that log will also uh, be included in the system info bundle as a textual representation. So if you run into any kind of issues and they suddenly started after some kind of update but you do not know anymore what you actually did update it from which version, version you came to, which version you went and all that, this will no longer be a problem as long as that happened within the last 30 days because if you share a system info bundle I will now be able to look at it or anyone helping you will now be able to look at it and see that you came from for example Octoprint version well obviously it will only work starting with 170 but it will then be uh, be possible to say well you updated from 170 to 171 or from 170 to 2.0 or whatnot. So yeah that should hopefully help uh, a bit more with uh, the investigative part of uh, issue analysis and, and such and, and trying to figure out why certain things start behaving weirdly at some point. And also finally solve the issue that we have had, have seen a lot on the forums where people were like, okay, something stopped working after the update and then we asked them where they were coming from and they had absolutely no clue. So in the future we can just take a look. Speaking of the system info bundle, that will also in the future now um, include some Octopi specific log files because uh, so far stuff like the, the webcam D log and the HA proxy log were not in there. But if Octoprint detects that it is running on an Octopi instance through the bundled Pi support plugin, that will now also take care of injecting these log files into the system info bundle so that we have access to that 
when you seek help in the in the forums on discord or wherever else you might be posting one of these bundles and of course the system info bundle viewer will also allow you to look at that stuff to yourself if you so want to um, and yeah the idea here really is to make it as easy and straightforward as possible for everyone for every single user of octoprint to to provide us with the necessary info in order to be able to help you all and yeah so more data into the system info bundle. I know that some people, and I've seen this on the forums, are like, why do you need all this data? So first of all, all this data here is really just log files. Um, and we need those because otherwise we have no chance to figure out what happened when something happened. Um, and that is something that I can only emphasize here. I do not want to get any kind of, 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 I do not want to snoop or anything like that. I am not interested in the files you print. I'm not interested in, in, in all of that. I, I really just, or in a network architecture or whatnot, all I want and all we as the people helping uh, others with their Octoprint issues want is to know what plugins you are running, on what you are running them, what if, if there is an under voltage situation, uh, what kind of architecture we are looking at, because if, if some bug is, for example, Linux only, it doesn't help if uh, it is, for example, Windows only, it doesn't help if we try to reproduce it under Linux and can't, so th stuff like this. And the past experiences have shown that getting this kind of information from people is hard because it is effort to provide this info to collect all the bits and pieces together from octoprint from the environment and all that and instead of having every single user do the legwork repeatedly it is way way more comf comfortable for them to just click a button download a system info bundle and be done with it speaking of which and let me quickly switch over back here again I also changed for 170, I also changed the system information dialog a bit because uh, we've seen some issues where people on the forum were just copy pasting this part here, which was the first iteration before the actual zipped bundles with all the locks and all that uh, were created and did not actually download the info, bun uh, info bundle that we want to have more than that. I mean, this is also already quite helpful, but this here is included in the system info bundle and the system info bundle also includes the log files that we so desperately need in, in order to help people. So this is now hidden a bit more and instead you get this button, this download button um, with which to download the system info bundle. And just as a reminder, you can get that through the settings dialog. You can also get that by this little thing. And there are also some command line options that you can use in order to uh, retrieve this data. Okay, so what else went into 170 or what is going to be 170? Well, um, I added a new hook so that plugins can now extend the system commands. So, so stuff like shutdown octoprint can now also be extended by a plugin by things like, I don't know, uh, toggle some GPIO switch or uh, enable, disable the webcam or something like that. Um, Starting with 170, Octoprint will also now show a little notification with a warning if you are still running it under Python 2, which has been end of life since January 1st, 2020. So I one and a half, over one and a half years now. And uh, as a reminder, Octoprint has been supporting Python 3 since uh, Octoprint 140, which was released la in March 2020. And uh, the recent latest Octopi version 018, which was released, I think, in September 2020, is also already shipping with Python 3. So considering that you get way, way, way improved performance with Python 3, that most of the plugins last count, we were something at something like 81% or so, are already compatible to Python 3, that Python 2 is end of life, does not get updates anymore and uh, such. Please update as soon as possible and Octoprint will also now tell you if, the, if you really should consider doing that and point you to information on how to do that. Yeah, then I also fixed some issues with file analysis. So it turns out that Octoprint was stumbling if you were uploading a G-code file, mostly usually a test G-code file that did not include any kind of extrusions and uh, that was causing problems then and those have been fixed. And also uh, Octoprint will now track the browser and OS version when you load the core UI um, and report that back to the anonymous usage tracker, tracking server 
If you have opted into usage tracking and if you have not disabled this behavior, which you can, as always, all of this is um, very privacy focused and leaves you fully in control whether you actually want to share this kind of data or not. But this kind of data will help uh, um, me and other developers <laughs> and contributors to decide um, also plug-in authors, of course, uh, to decide what kind of browsers we can or should be targeting. Uh, case in point, we had a bunch of issues uh, with, with Octoprint recently, where, it, the, the, yeah, where some third-party plugins and also some code constructs in Octoprint's core itself were causing issues on some ancient iPads that were being used as, as, yeah, as printer monitor. And uh, it certainly helps to know how many of these are still out there and whether it makes sense to actually still try to support that stuff or rather migrate to more modern browser support, which would solve us a lot of trouble, especially looking at uh, a future more modern UI that is also still in the pipeline, hopefully for 2.0, but definitely uh, soonish. Um, and, and it's somewhat something burning in my pocket, so to speak. Also, uh, yeah, uh, some of you might have noticed or seen that Marlin now supports position auto-reporting regularly, like it does with, with temperature and with, with SD status, SD printing status. And Octoprint will also now um, uh, uh, enable this or, or support this from its end if it detects that the, 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 the firmware in question says, hi, I can do that. Uh, and so make things a bit easier to track in the process. Yeah, and then also a bunch of bug fixes and uh, performance fixes and typo fixes, doc fixes, and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of stuff was done on 1.7.0, which kind of surprised me because I was actually under the impression when I was preparing all of the stuff that I did for you uh, for this um, for this recording here today, uh, I was thinking that I had primarily worked on 2.0, but apparently I didn't. So yeah, um, speaking of which, what else did I do? 2.0, which was actually like my main focus the past couple of weeks. Um, you remember, I hope at least from, from, from past reports on this, that I've been working on a new com layer for several years now, actually, and, 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 and uh, that is supposed to go into 2.0. And uh, the last time that I talked about that in Octoprint on Air number 39, I told you that I still wanted to get AutoConnect to work so that you could actually, uh, yeah, AutoConnect and AutoDetect so that you could actually say, hey, by the way, always connect to this specific printer when the server starts up and if it's there. And uh, I am happy to report that this works now. So does auto detection. So if you are not pro uh, completely sure what kind of printer you have there, it will be able to detect this as well, as long as you at least tell it if it's a serial connection or not. Um, also, the connection profile management that last time was still missing now works. And actually, let me quickly switch you over back to here because you might have noticed this looks a bit different um, than uh, what you are used to right now because this is actually a, a 2.0 dev version on the COM refactoring branch running here. And um, I've shown you this a bunch of times already, I think, with the, with the whole... Um, protocol, parameter editor, and, and, and flavor selection here, and, and things like this. And also the transport options that we have, serial connection, and also TCP connection. And um, what I also did, but have what, what, what is currently not visible here is also the, the possibility to connect via Unix domain socket and all that, because this is pretty trivial to add new transport layers now, new methods of um, communicating to printers uh, uh, here. Um, basically, it boils down to something like 20 to 30 lines of code, which is pretty amazing considering what amount of effort it would be with the with the last uh, with the with the current com layer. And uh, as you can say, you can save that here, and you can also select a connection profile up here. And this um, corresponds to this new. I have no idea about my, my, why my PC is so slow right now, but let's try to ignore it and con continue. Um, maybe it's the recording uh, eating up some, I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, this is all the connection profiles that are currently there. You get an overview of the printer profile protocol and transport that was selected for it. You can uh, mark it as the default to select right after loading the UI and you can also edit it. So. Um, you can name identifier, say whether it wants you want it to auto connect or not. 
Um, the printer profile can be selected here, the protocol can be selected here, where we all currently only have this one, but um, you can specify the flavor and all that and, and save that, and you can also select the transport. So this, for example, right now is uh, connecting actually to localhost port 4321, and this is the default port that an adjustment of the virtual printer is now listening, because the virtual printer built into Octoprint now also allows um, to be connected to not only through a virtual serial port, but also through an actual physical TCP port. Um, and thanks to work by uh, Can't Live Long, aka Sean, from uh, PSU Control fame, uh, or of PSU Control fame, it can also do that with, uh, it can also be exposed now as a virtual um, serial interface, or it can communicate over an actual serial interface, and uh, yeah, and I also made it so that it works as a Unix domain socket. So that allows me to test all of this stuff. And that will hopefully also show some of you uh, who are interested in other means of connecting to a printer on how to do that kind of stuff and possibly add more transports. Yeah. So that was done. You can also, of course, add a new profile here. And then uh, another thing that took a lot more uh, work than I originally expected uh, it would uh, was uh, the generic settings UI for the transports. So, for example, for the baud rates that should be offered for connecting on the serial port, because this is not something that is connection specific, this is more like a general overall setting of the whole transport, of the whole serial connection transport. Same goes for auto detection baud rates, ignored ports and initial auto detection delay, because I cannot tie this to a connection profile, considering that uh, auto detection is responsible for selecting the connection profile to begin with somewhat. So yeah. Um, and this will be this new UI here. And here we also have some general um, connection specific settings that for now are only the logging uh, configuration that used to be only enable or disable serial log. And now we actually have two um, things here that uh, can be enabled or disabled here. Yeah. So a lot of shifting stuff around, making it reusable, so I could use the same form, the, the automatic gener automatically generated form elements for all of this here, because all of this here is specified in code. I did not write HTML for all of this, and I didn't write it for all of this either. That all gets generated based on the selected uh, stuff up here. And um, in order to make all this reusable, I had to do some heavy lifting and that was a bit of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a headache here and there, but yeah. The, I hope that I will also be able to reuse all of these, um, yeah, basically all of this automatic settings UI generation stuff that I have built now for the connection profiles and for the protocol and transport settings to use for all of the settings. So the idea here is that um, in the future, Octoprint will still have this this unified settings API where all the settings uh, from the from the backend, so the whole configuration can be requested by uh, yeah by clients, whether it be the core API or uh, the core UI or some some other third party one. But I also want to expose um, the metadata associated with the setting. So what type is it? What are the default values? How should it be render rendered? If it's some kind of thing where you can choose from multiples, what are the options? Stuff like that. And then you could just render a full-blown settings UI automatically. It would also remove a ton of boilerplate that is currently necessary in the back end in order to convert from one part to the other part. Uh, and, and from data types and to do data sanitization, <laughs> tricky word. Um, and yeah, so, but first of all, the focus was on getting these uh, UI parts to work and they work. And I'm pretty, pretty happy that that uh, finally does what it is supposed to do. Yeah. And I obviously also fixed a ton of bugs in the process that I crept up whenever I worked on this. Um, yeah, so what is still to do here? Um, there are still some minor issues here and there. So I currently have the problem that, for example, the firmware check that tells you, hey, by the way, uh, your, your, your printer does not have some runaway protection or stuff like that, it triggers slightly too late uh, because the connection handshake process that, that changed slightly and the, the, the plugin doesn't get notified of all of the message that arrived from the firmware yet. 
uh, and because of that it sometimes misses things and that obviously needs to be fixed because that is a bit crucial um, to work. So I need to look into why that is. Then I still have a bunch of settings to migrate from the old serial um, config stuff in, in current configurations into the into this new default connection profile that will be generated from them called migrated from serial settings. So when you start Octoprint 2.0 with this new com layer up for the first time, Octoprint will migrate everything that you configured in the old connection dialog over to this new profile and also over to other settings as needed and some stuff there still needs to be migrated but the basics are in there. Um, what else? Uh, yeah I still see some issues when there is some issue with con connecting to for example when I try to connect to, to, to a printer with the wrong baud rate then for some reasons the timeouts don't really fire yet and you just get stuck on this half connected state and you can disconnect then sometimes sometimes not and yeah so the error handling that still needs some work and I need to figure out how to make it so that it does not uh, get stuck in anything but always times out in a meaningful manner um, and also the unit tests are currently broken <laughs> and every time that I push something to github I get a get get a get a, um, a, a test failure message so every time that I push therefore I feel bad but yeah so that needs to be looked in but once all that is tackled uh, I'll actually be able to merge this on devil and then the box uh, the box crushing can begin because I hope that then some more of you will actually try to run it work with it um, I can promise you that at the beginning there will be some bugs there because I've been only able to test it with my stuff here uh, and not every printer under the sun but still once this hits devil it would be lovely if those of you who are comfortable enough with running like the absolute bleeding edge code base uh, if, if those of you who are comfortable with that would just help in, in, in testing the new com layer that would be pretty amazing. Okay so what else have I been up to? Um, one thing that uh, actually flew a bit under the radar but which is going to help us a ton hopefully in the future with um, with up-to-date Octopi builds basically. So um, it's happened a, a couple of times now in the past with, uh, with, with a bunch of vendors who were selling Octoprint kits that they were uh, also including a customized version of Oct Octopi but um, were creating that in a wrong way, in a way where it was causing security issues because of shared keys and, and, and duplicated global API, API keys in Octoprint and also SSH key credentials and stuff like that being included in the image instead of auto-generated. And that has, yeah, as I said, that hap has happened a lot in the past. And in order to make it a bit easier, hopefully in the future, that it will no longer happen that much for vendors, I created a new little script uh, or a new little tool called a Customizer. And yes, I am proud of that name, which can take an arbitrary, arbitrary, well, primarily Raspberry Pi OS image, but probably also other I images and then um, can do small adjustment scripts, run small adjustment scripts on it without booting it and thus without uh, causing the data to become tainted in some way. Um, I have already actually created uh, a custom build with this tool, which is like, consider it the Octopi build script dumped down and made more compact basically um, and I've already created a small tool with that which will make sure to generate a new Octopi image with the latest Octoprint on it already uh, based on the current Octopi release and the current Octoprint release. So in the future when I for example push L170 uh, this repository will get a ping it will see oh there is a new Octoprint version then it will take Octopi 018 update Octoprint on it, repackage it back up and then um, release it as, a, as an actual release on, on GitHub. Um, currently this is not tied into the download button on the Octoprint site, but I hope once it proves to actually work reliably, we will be able to do that and also tie it into the Raspberry Pi imager where Octoprint is now a first class citizen as well. Um, because then you will be guaranteed to always get the latest version of Octoprint with the current Octopi install and not something that was current uh, whenever the, the Octopi image was built. Um, yeah, 
Okay, and what I also did uh, was, uh, you might remember that in the past I, I said that I am primarily for, uh, using uh, PyCharm as my IDE and that changed. So um, I recently got access to the, pre uh, the, the technology preview of uh, GitHub Copilot, which is this like, let's call it an A-powered auto-completion. They call it an AI-powered um, pair programmer, but I wouldn't necessarily give it that much credit. I mean, it's amazing and it's pretty, pretty awesome how much work it can save you, but it cannot think, you know, like it, it can only complete. So, uh, and it can try to complete what I'm trying to write, but yeah. So um, in any case, that motivated me because this is only available for Visual Studio Code so far to also give Visual Studio Code a try as an IDE. And I've now been doing that for, I think, two or three months, how matter, uh, no, uh, uh, however long Copilot has been out, uh, not months, weeks. The, yeah two to three weeks and uh, yeah it has been an actually great experience I mean the refactoring capabilities are not on par with PyCharm I would say so sometimes it misses some stuff when I rename things but all in all um, I have not really been missing a lot and um, the strong focus on, on, on using sh keyboard shortcuts for everything under the sun is uh, really helping me in um, yeah being more more performant really because I do not constantly have to reach for the uh, for the mouse and uh, yeah I'm I'm not sure if I will continue to use Copilot but I will definitely continue to use VS Code um, so uh, if there's any kind of interest um, you might remember that a while back I did a live stream on how to set up an Octoprint development environment um, I could also show uh, do another one of these and, and show you how I've set up the VS Code centric um, environment now that I have a bit more insight than I did back then. I, I think I showed that back then with VS Code, but uh, not really with a full-blown setup like I have it now uh, with a ton of uh, extensions and um, actual um, automation. So when I hit Control S, uh, I have something hooked up that will make sure that the code is automatically reformatted and uh, I saw this run and uh, pretty much a bunch of pre-commit hooks are being run. And yeah, also huge shout out to Ben Seicher, Sucha, <laughs> um, for contributing um, instructions on how to uh, set up Octoprint in VS Code as an IDE for the documentation. So that got merged yesterday, I think, or the day before. And um, yeah, that was perfect timing, really, because I could then at least sanity check what I had done. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and also, um, I don't know if you've heard about that, but Visual Studio Code also has this nifty feature called developer containers, where you can basically just fire up the IDE in the dedicated Docker environment, where all of the stuff that you need, in Octoprint's case, something like Python <laughs> and uh, dependencies and such is already uh, set up, um, and then code directly in that, and you do not have to worry about all of this, this all of this dependency hell and tooling hell that you sometimes find yourself in when setting up open source projects. And I've actually been looking into making one, setting up one of these, a configuration for one of these for Octoprint as well, and I'm making progress there. So this is like an after hour experiment that I do in order to more or less learn more about VS Code and less an Octoprint centric work. But um, yeah, if it bears any kind of fruits, uh, I'll definitely be sure to include it in uh, the Octoprint source code because I think that could be quite interesting also for plugin developers maybe. So um, yeah. Also, if you have any kind of experience with that, be sure to give me a holler because I would be interesting to learn if there are any kind of best practices that I should be following with this kind of approach. It's a first for me. Yeah. Okay. And the final thing <laughs> that has happened over the course of the two, last two months is I also got my second BioNTech Pfizer shot around five weeks ago now. Um, the day right after wasn't fun, like I was hurting all over and had a headache, a splitting one, and I couldn't sleep because I was in pain, but I was really tired, so all I wanted to do was to sleep, so it wasn't fun, but um, it was well worth it. And um, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to get it and get it in a timely manner, not like many others of my fellow countrymen who had to wait for it ages. Um, and I mean, I already had to wait for it for ages and yeah, still got it earlier than many. 
Okay, but since after my last uh, Octoprint on Air, someone actually reached out to me and wrote me a very scared sounding email about the dangers of mRNA vaccines and our, how, about how all of this is just like, gov like some government control experiment or, or some such weird things. So yeah, I feel obligated to make some things clear here. Uh, so no, mRNA vaccines are not gene therapy or anything like that and they cannot even touch your DNA. It's physically and chemically and whatnot absolutely impossible because they do not even enter the core of your cell. All that they do is that they are basically roping your cells protein manufacturing uh, mechanisms into producing spike proteins. So stuff that you can find on the hull of the COVID-19 um, or, uh, of the, of the, or rather of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, not the virus itself, fragments of its hull. So fragments, basically like, considering a, a, a picture of the, of the face of that thing. So, and um, you cannot infect others with this, with these fragments, and uh, you also cannot infect yourself with these fragments. All it does is basically giving your uh, immune system something to look at and see, oh, those are the baddies, and then they know that they need to attack them. Consider it uh, yeah, like a wanted post that it gets faxed to your, uh, into your bloodstream. And um, there is actually a pretty, uh, a pretty amazing article by Bert uh, that I forgot to link. Um, and I hope that I can quickly find it now. I can, actually. Um, which is called, oh, I should also probably switch you over here, which is called reverse engineering the source code of the BioNTech Pfizer SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And I can only heartily recommend if you're even remotely interested in the science behind all of this to read that, because that thing not only explains to you how an mRNA vaccine works, but it also actually shows you the, the, the mRNA sequence contained in the, SARS, in the, in the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine and tells you, make, pretty much makes a cold walkthrough and tells you what all of the single fragments of that, and uh, I think they, are, they have a specific name, but I forgot what it was. So all of the code, all of the commands do and how they work. And it's pretty amazing if you've ever looked at shell code and have ever had uh, even a slight interest in um, computer security, because those things actually contain an obsolete and that was like, mind blown for me when I read this article back in January. But yeah, so Google, best just Google for uh, reverse engineering the source code of the BioNTech Pfizer SARS-CoV-2 or pause now and write down this URL up there. Or, um, uh, or uh, pretty much just Googling Bird Hub and, uh, and, and, and BioNTech will probably, or mRNA will already or, uh, or also get you this. And I'll also see that I link it in the description. Okay, so uh, that was the article recommendation. Um, what is really important to me here and why I even get up on my horse right now or on my soapbox right now about all of this topic is, um, first of all, this vaccine is as safe as a vaccine can be. And no, it is, there were no cut corners or anything like it. The only reason why we got it as fast as we did was because Pretty much the whole planet was focused on creating a vaccine, so there was a whole lot less of running after funding for the necessary research and running after funding for the necessary trial phases. It was also way, way easier to get, um, yeah, to get the the the, the go ahead for all of these separate, uh, separate phases. And uh, so, in short, vaccine de development could, as far as I understand it, usually um, work as fast as this one did if there wasn't that much red tape involved in the for form of pure bureaucracy. Not in order to prevent stuff from happening, but just like pure paper writing and sending back and forth and waiting for people to read it and waiting for people to write more and so, yeah. Long story short, if you can, then please, please, please get vaccinated because everyone who doesn't just makes makes one more body in which the next big var uh, var uh, variant that then maybe even no longer uh, can get stopped by the vaccine gets bred and uh, yeah evolution is a thing and it's 
it's happening as we speak. Just look at the Delta variant that is currently wreaking havoc uh, and is also causing rising numbers in Germany again. And uh, yeah, um, so we really do not want to breed even more more uh, variations here. That's it's already gone on way too long. And if you have the possibility to get a shot, then by all means, please do and don't wait for it and do it right now. Yeah. And I'm really sorry that I had to derail the usual content here so much with that, but all of this fear, uncertainty and doubt this is, that is currently being spread about vaccination in general and the COVID vaccines in, 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 in uh, um, specifically, and the general hostility against any kind of scientific approach and against research and all that, that is making me absolutely beyond angry. So... Just listen to the science, please, and don't listen to University of YouTube. That also obviously includes me. If you do not believe me, then please look up this stuff and educate yourself, but do it in a scientific community. Yeah. Okay, so I'm getting down from my soapbox here again. It's just this email that I got there that was like that long with a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt in there and a lot of conspiracy and all of that, that just kind of it was a bit upsetting, really. I mean, yeah. And not because I was worried about the contents, but rather because I was worried that people actually believe all this stuff. Okay, so back to the actual topic of this uh, episode. What are the next steps? So I already mentioned I did a ton of work on 170 and this is actually... Yeah, there's actually no, currently nothing left open on the issue tracker that needs to go into that. So the idea here would be to get a first RC out as soon as possible. Um, so it's, I guess it's time to write a change log and, uh, and take care of that. And then I already also mentioned that there are still some open tasks on the com refactoring part that will go into 2.0. So I need to take care of them. And once I have, I will merge that on Devil as well. And then it can get tested by more people than just me. And I mean, in theory, it could already be tested by more people than just me right now. But I appreciate that a feature branch is maybe not something that you want to set your Octoprint instance to. Um, and as I also said, I've been working on this for years now. So the day that this gets merged on Devil will be a day that I really, really celebrate. <laughs> uh, considering how much this whole development got stalled again and again and again by smaller and larger catastrophes. The last one, by the way, being the pandemic, because suddenly the general maintenance overhead grew so large that I simply could not even think about sitting down and focusing on this for a while. And it needs a ton of focus because huge rewrite very uh, intense yeah uh, I also still want to do my data.octoprint.org in react rewrite practice session thing but so far I haven't gotten around to do that because 2.0 was like taking up all my spare cycles and speaking of spare cycles I'm uh, running very much low on them now so uh, one other thing that I'll do in the near future like in a month, um, in, uh, in in starting in, in mid August is a, a summer vacation because yeah I really need some tabula rasa and uh, getting my head clear again. Okay, so that was that. Now I promised you all to take a quick look at the stats again. So let me quickly switch us over here as well. Um, so this is only the last seven days because if I try to fetch the last thirty, the whole uh, tracking thing comes to a screeching halt but what is interesting here is that at least in the last seven days we've actually seen for the first time more python 3 instances out there than python 2 and this is like yay about time uh, and i'm actually giving a talk about uh yeah the lessons learned from uh, from from running something like octoprint like an end user facing kind of software in Python uh, on at EuroPython next week and this whole Python 2 to Python 3 migration will also feature heavily in this talk so this is a perfect timing really. Um, yeah and uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm logging the web UI load, load events now in 170 and this is over the past 30 days 
uh, and as you can see, not many people are actually running the, the, the 170 or devil branches, but some are. And I hope that in the future that will give us more insight about the browsers that people are actually using. So right now it looks like Waterfox slash Firefox is the most common one, but we'll have to see if this con... Oh, actually not. Ah, I have to check why Chrome does not report versions apparently here. But yeah, so this is an issue for me to look in. But so let's correct that. The majority is actually running Chrome uh, of the people testing this. Could also have been me though, because I was constantly refreshing and I was running uh, the devil branch or the, the com refactoring branch in Chrome because uh, the, the errors that I was trying to debug, the error reporting in Chrome is better for that. So. That could actually have been me, yeah, come to think of it. Um, but yeah, I'll have to look into this. And um, to give you a, a more broad uh, look back into the future, here we're also on data.octoprint.org. We also have the uh, version distribution over the past 30 days. And we see that there were uh, 177,227 unique instances over the, past of the, uh, over the course of the past 30 days. You might notice that this number has gotten down a bit since um, since winter, and I find that extra interesting, I gotta say, because apparently there are some seasonal fluctuations in the use of Octoprint here. And I already noticed this last year, but not as heavily. I mean, there was also a pandemic. Um, we still have a pandemic going on, but yeah, <laughs> you, you get the drift. Um, yeah, and here it still looks like uh, Python Python 3 is still dominating here for some reason. Uh, Python 2, sorry. Hmm, I have to check why that is. But still, um, we have almost at least no parity. Uh, and I will be very, very happy once we actually shift this over because, um, yeah, Python 2 is end of life. You all need to update. Yeah. Okay, so that was that. And uh, that now brings us actually to our Q&A segment. And I'm simply going to switch over here um, to this uh, small uh, slides, slide set that I prepared. And the first one is, the uh, first question is paraphrased, by the way, by Richard. How can I make it easier to distinguish multiple Octoprint instances in the browser? And I know that Richard already found this out because he sent in another question right after saying to basically disregard this. But I figured it might be good to just show it again because some people might just never have fallen over this option. And uh, yeah, it could maybe help um, to make it a bit more visible. So if you look into your Octoprint settings here, you uh, have this appearance section down here under Octoprint server folders appearance. And if you click here, you see here is a color box and you can change the color here. And what happens is that not only does, if I leave this here, not only, oh, I should have saved this. <laughs> um, if I change the color here to, for example, red uh, and hit save, not only does the color up here in the bar change, but also the color here in the favicon changes. So if I had multiple instances now, I could just color code them all. And then I would just know that red, for example, is my development instance. And then, I don't know, green maybe is one printer and blue is another one. And yeah, so this is one option. And the other is, you can also give a title here. So, um, that will also be shown in the navigation. So you say, see right now, in the, it, it will show here and it will also show here, if I remember correctly. So for example, if I just call this development and save, you will see that the tab's name now changed to development in square brackets Octoprint and up here it also changed to development. So you can use these to make stuff easier distinguishable. And the favicon coloring is probably the best if you, like me, habitually run like 100 tabs or something and really just have the favicon left to be able to distinguish between stuff. Yeah, so that was that. And then there was another question by Charlie. Do you have any favorite three par uh, third party projects that connect with Octoprint? And if so, what are they and why do you like them? Okay, so um, I have a bunch actually that I want to mention here. 
first of all, so even though I still haven't used either, and I am really embarrassed about that, um, uh, I'm a, a really huge fan of both Octolabs and Arc Welder by uh, Brad, aka former, former Lurker. Um, they are, I, I don't know, they just, just blew me away with with how in, 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 innovative, innovative, innovative they are and, and how they manage to do something that I never expected Octoprint to be able to do, uh, both of them. And, and yeah, just do it via the plugin interface. And at least in the case of Octolabs, that also led to some very nice cooperation with Brad in order to uh, make some of these things even possible. Uh, so, uh, for example, Octoprint allows plugins to mm, pretty much hold the processing of the file, uh, like hold uh, a mutex that will prevent Octoprint from continuing. And yeah, putting the job on hold pretty much. And this only got added because Brad needed it for Octolabs. So yeah, um, active cross-pollination basically. And um, yeah, so these both of these, are, in my opinion, have put things to the next level for a ton of users out there. Uh, another project that I would really like to name drop here is uh, Octofarm because yeah, like so many people over the years kept on asking me, is there some kind of way that I can administrate multiple uh, instances of Octoprint and maybe also run some kind of print queue and uh, just get a better overview over everything and all that. And I, 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 all I always could say was there's an API. It would be lovely if someone just writes that. I cannot, I do not have the time. Uh, and maybe at some point I will be able to point someone then to your project. And Octofarm is actually the project that I am now able to point people to whenever I get this question, and this is pretty amazing. So yeah, that just um, makes me so entirely happy that someone finally did this and did it well, and that it's working so nicely and uh, is, 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 yeah, is, is, is um, checking so many boxes with regards to features that it supports. Then I want to give a shout out to Jim Neal here because uh, my printers would not be my printers without his Tusmotor plugin, which I use in order to power off the printers themselves when I'm not actually currently printing. But I always leave Octoprint itself on and running. And um, what I also use personally when checking on my prints on my phone is uh, the uh, Octo Remote for Octoprint Android app. So also a shout out to that one. Uh, really nice, not not many like huge bloat of features or something or 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 complicated things, but it's just it's just like a mobile view basically, and it just works, and I like that. It it keeps things easy, yeah. But all in all, even with a few of these shoutouts now behind me, uh, in general, I'm just absolutely excited about the ecosystem as a whole, and and yeah how many people get creative here and use Octoprint in a way that I never expected. And like there was someone who implemented a pick and place machine with it. And um, I just, I would never have imagined that people get so creative and people use it in so many exciting ways and that everything would just so flourish and, and grow and all that. So um, yeah, all in all, I'm, I could just say that Anything third party just makes me really, really happy, and um, uh, and and uh, and also humble in a way, and I, because I mean, I built this because I had to scratch a personal itch, and now so many people are building so awesome stuff around it, and that is just wow. Okay, I really never did expect that, but yeah. Okay, and that was already actually the two questions that I had. Oh, yeah, there is no, uh, no, 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 uh, no live chat slide, obviously, because there is no live chat. Um, uh, so, yeah, that actually then concludes what I had prepared for this episode, and I hope it was interesting. And uh, I will see that I schedule. Um, the next one ASAP, though it will probably be after my vacation. Um, I don't think I still can squeeze it into August, but I'll see. Maybe I can. We, we'll have to see. Um, and uh, yeah, if you 
If you happen to be at EuroPython next week, virtually, of course, because it's a virtual conference, then, uh, and if you see me running around virtually, <laughs> uh, then please give me a, 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 please give me a, 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 a virtual handshake. Um, and also maybe take a look at my talk on Thursday at 13.45, I think. Um, and yeah, that's about it, I think. Uh, thank you for being here and uh, stay healthy, get vaccinated if you can, wear a mask uh, and uh, yeah, happy printing and until next time. Bye.